Welcome to 74 Escapes new podcast series, Breaking Bread with Vera Lulu. I'm Vera, and I will take you on a gastronomic journey to explore food as an expression of cultural identity. I'll be hosting chefs and industry professionals from all over the world to discuss everything about this art form that really nourishes our souls. Let's start. On this episode of Breaking Bread with Vera Lulu, I have the pleasure of speaking with my dear friend, chef, poet, and philosopher Bruno Verjou. Bruno is a chef and owner of Michelin star table by Bruno Verjou in Paris. Self-proclaimed wild child who grew up in the nature near Lyon, where an early age was bathed in the wilderness. At the age of eight, he cultivated his family garden and foraged forests and rivers in search of herbs, mushrooms, and fish. His interests are far and wide from fascination with medicine to literature to food writing for Le Foodin, Omnivore, and Au Quotidien. And today, I'm so honored to welcome my friend Bruno Verjou. Chef, how are you today? Hello, I'm fine. <laughs> I, I'm happy seeing you. <laughs> I'm happy to see you too. It's yeah, been a long too. time. <laughs> Chef, so you said, and I quote, the way we eat decides the world we live in. Speak if you would about this philosophy and how it's informed your trajectory as cook and restaurant. You know, you said, yeah, I, I said that maybe, you know, this sentence was about eight years ago. And if you just look at the, act, at the now situation, it's something so important because I do believe that, I'm sorry for that, because it's maybe not too cool to, uh, to your American citizen, but COVID is really the illness of the malbouf, of the bad heating, you know, and that we, we now can show that the people that they eat, you know, all this kind of agro industry food and all, you know, all the, what we call junk food, they, they, they really treated so bad their body that they can be very, very affected by, by any illness and by the way, by the COVID. And uh, so the, the, the way we, we spend money to the good people. I mean, the people that they do something right. And uh, I mean, in the good sense for the planet uh, in terms of, I don't know, making growing vegetables or making growing chickens or fishing well, beautiful things on, on a very clean and nice spot on ocean, ocean or, you know, all these kind of things. And if you feed your body with that, you're for sure in a better shape in a better vibration, in a better energy. And so that doesn't mean that you will not, never have any illness, but that means that you're more, more, you know, resilient to, 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 to such of things coming from a world that doesn't go on the, you know, on, on, the, good, on the good way. And uh, so this is, this is what I really deeply do believe. And that was the reason why I created ta Table. That was to say, hey, please give the money to the right people, feed yourself with very, uh, um, you know, bio and more than bio, organic and white culture things. And for sure, you will belong. Um, you will be the one of the, let's say, you will. But at, at the same time, I still feel like in New York, especially, a lot of people uh, here actually do go to the markets and more people in New York, rather than the whole US, do know about seasonality. So. Um, yeah. It's changing, but it's still really, really behind after Europe, I think. Um, you have also said that food is part of me since childhood. You grew up near Lyon, and you were a wild child by your own admission. So what else uh, did your upbringing teach you about your craft? Yeah, it's, it's difficult to say because, you know, when you are very... Uh, uh, I mean, uh, an early, ch early in the in the China, you you don't for for sure you you have a lot of um, impression. You get many information, and uh, and most of them you don't. You just keep it inside you. And one day, I don't know, one day after a lot of time passing, and there is some who reappear. You know, this is like if you had a I don't know, you had a beautiful stone, uh, a bit rough. And you put in the water, and after, I don't know, years and years of water flowing, there is things coming out again. There was inside, but cannot show. And after that, the friction to, to the world, to your life, there is things coming back. And maybe that was a very important part of my life, 
when I was a child and I was going in the river to catching a trout fish by hand or, or some crayfish or catching uh, frogs because we love frogs in France so I was catching frogs too or, or rabbits or whatever or fruit of making some radish carrots or, or, or salad you know and then you you absolutely forget that you know you don't you don't care it's okay but one day this come back to you and maybe um you you have the taste of what the what the what the thing should taste so that is in my actual job is very very efficient you know because when i eat something i know somewhere how it's have to taste and why it's good why it's not good and so it's very helpful you know yes um and as i understand you had ambitions to study medicine and you had it to california is that is yeah. that yeah yeah that's that's right and then i moved to china. and and yeah and then i moved to china because i started a business there and i spent 18 years in china uh you know that was not only in china i mean but uh, i was mainly uh, my business was ma mainly in, uh, in china um yeah that was very interesting and by the way in china i learned a lot about heating uh, because these people they are crazy about food, fresh food, and uh, and there, there is a, such an ancient knowledge for everything. And uh, w what is very interesting nowadays is that you know the feeding people in China, in China mainland is something have to go with medicine because uh, they know that depend of the shape you you're gonna be because it's like you know in the old times we were very very aware of the quality of the food because that this sometimes can kill people if it's not very well done or if it's too old or if it's rotten or whatever. And so in China, they keep this and they have an incredible knowledge about the way to cook or, or uncook or whatever. And, um, and I, I think by eating that, I learned a lot too. And now this Chinese part of me is very, very important in the way um, I create my dishes. For example, to be very specific, um, I, I do believe that, okay, when I create a, a dish, there is a sort of a storytelling, there is a narration, and there is many stories in the plate, but there is some that concern the, the I mean, the bottom part of, of your body, that means the, the, what we call the, the stomach brain, okay, that's go down, and there is some that they have to go up to go to your limbic brain, and for me, it's very important, so it's a sort of yin and yang uh, things, and it's, it's a holistic way to, to understood how feeling people, to give them a lot of joy, a lot of happiness, a lot of memory or remembering things, and at the same time to give them good elements and good energy to their body to be a very efficient too. So, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Wow, I admire your approach on, on how you uh, approach and create the dish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. It's beautiful. So, yeah, I don't, I, you, you, you know, I don't have any secret for you. <laughs> uh, I actually find Chinese food uh, extremely complex and and yeah. and very 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 difficult. Uh, it's 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 very complex uh, complex cuisine, don't you find? Yeah, it's a very complex cuisine, and uh, it's very complex people because they have a, 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 a incredible knowledge. Years after a thousand years after a thousand years, uh, they have incredible ingredients too, and they are really, really taking care of the quality of the ingredients most of the time. And on the same time, they they have a uh, they they understand so well what food should be, even, you know, high-end food. And uh, to tell you the truth, I don't know if you know this girl, which is an incredible girl, so clever in the, in the food business, which is Ag Agnes Shi, yeah. you know? She's a, she, she's, a, she's a Hong Kong journalist, food critic and food journalist. And she, she's the, girl, the most clever girl I never met about food. And she's, she teach me so much about that, the way that she have the perception of dishes, of the way the things are done, cooking or not or whatever. And so she helped me a lot in this field. I would love you know? to make a research. Yeah, you have to, you have to meet her one day. She's, she's very incredible, incredible, yeah. yeah. So in the mid-1980s, you have, as you described, a revolution. You meet Alain Passard. 
So tell me, yeah. talk about your <laughs> experience with him. Yeah, the, the, the first meeting was like a joke because we have a common friend and he was very proud to introduce me to Alain Passard. And uh, for, to tell you the truth, that was the first time uh, uh, I had the lunch at uh, our Page restaurant. Um, and I don't know, when we met, uh, one, uh, at, uh, that was maybe at the middle of the, of the lunch that Alain show on, on the main room. And I don't know, we just have a, at the first sight, you know, we decided to joke and to say the friend, and, and we pretend to be old friends and we never met. But we just pretended, yeah. And so my friend was a bit upset because he said, oh, why, you, why you don't tell me that you, you're a good friend and you know each other? I was so happy to just so say, oh, we cannot say anything, but you know, blah, blah, blah. But I, I, to tell you, that was the first time I met Alain. So that was on this joke. And, and we, this is very, um, you know, very interesting because that, that showed that how close we feel when we met for the first time. We had, for sure, he was a professional that was just somebody eating in his restaurant. But we had the same concern um, about vegetables, the same luby about these kind of things, how we can do with that. Because I was, uh, I was a cook in my home for my kids, for my friends. And I was very, very uh, intense with uh, uh, people making growing veggies or fishing or, or you know, taking care of chicken, of lamb, or whatever. So that was my really my, my main concern uh, out of my business. That was my pastime. You know, I was really obsessed with that. Going to market, going to visit people, and so we we had so much to share. And so I do remember that the first lunch, maybe we arrived at noon thirty, and I, I I went out of the restaurant at two o'clock in the morning. So we have lunch, dinner, and we we can even not separate. You know, and that was the beginning of a. 20, more than, I don't know now, it's a lot of time, maybe more than 25 years of really incredible close friendship. And when I started my restaurant uh, seven years ago, uh, I, I talked with Alain a lot, and that was the only guy, you know, I know so many chefs, but that was the only chef who texts me every day to say, Bruno, don't give up. I know it's so hard. I know it's so difficult for you. Don't give up. Don't give up. And he was really pushing me always and giving me good advice. And, uh, and you know, he was really like a brother. And that, by the way, we call each other frero, which means like, uh, you know, you can say what, bro in the... <laughs> in, a, in a modern slang, let's say. <laughs> but we say, in France, we say frero, which is more, you know, more close, maybe. Uh -huh. I know I was very fortunate to actually go uh, to eat at his uh, um, garden. Garden, yes. Yeah. So it was quite a fun experience. I think it must have been a seven-hour lunch too. So it was. And he's yeah, I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I did not spend the seven hours because I, I had to leave at uh, at five thirty because I have to went back to my restaurant in Paris because it was open on Saturday evening. But when I when I quit was yeah maybe I think five thirty. And uh, that was only the first service of meat. So I mean that, yes, you start at noon and you're just done at 9 p.m. or something, you know. <laughs> but Alain is so happy. Alain is so happy there because it's like, you know, it's a show. It's a show. It's He's doing it's things really everywhere. And, uh, yeah. He must have 20, 30 guests and uh, I yeah. met people and IST was there. I, it was such a fabulous day. I still think of it. Uh, with such you know joy and it must it, it was three years ago that i went yeah, and, and you see he's so and, happy he's <laughs> totally freestyle with the vegetables and everything and giving love and uh, and food for people which is uh, our concern you know we i think we do we we give more love than food we 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 have this uh, incredible you know uh, uh feeling that uh okay it's, you are, you have to be a part of something bigger and we are here to share something incredible uh, and uh, that that's the point yeah yes and it shows in your dishes yeah <laughs> yeah I, I hope so yeah yeah this is what yeah uh bruno so much like we're doing today speak of cultivating a taste for good things through writing and broadcasting in french culture uh you had uh you used to do podcasts is that correct yeah you still do them Weekly yeah, I, I was doing, what, what are you talking about? My video during the COVID, I mean, or no, a long time ago? Uh, I think a long time ago. Oh, yeah, yeah, I was doing podcast because, no, no, did, did, you mean when I was at, at Radio France, at France Culture, mm -hmm. the, the National Cultural Radio, yeah. 
no, I'm not doing that anymore. Uh, because, uh, you know, that, that was at this period of time, I spent four years and a half doing that, having a show every Sunday uh, with my friend Alain Kruger. We create the, 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 the show together. And uh, that was this show would decide, would make me decide to, to move on, to move to open a restaurant. That was my, you know, crazy part because I, I was really absolutely with no conscience of, of what it is having a restaurant. I was just thinking, oh my God, it's so cool cooking for people and uh, I will be so happy. But at the same time, I forget the mass part of the things that I had to run a restaurant to. I mean, people and, uh, you know, so it's, uh, yeah. And, um, and now, no, I don't have time for that. I do some video on my Instagram. Uh, I, I was doing that during the, the COVID uh, time. And that was a big, big thing because this brings me so many people to the restaurant and that's make the people coming very close to me. And I think maybe I, I, I was doing something very interesting, which is that, you know, like a radio, by, but by video. Because most of the time when you do video, you know, people are looking at you because you are doing something. So they are just watching, okay? They are watching somebody. There is a lot of people watching somebody doing, doing one thing. In my video, I think there is only... One people watching somebody talking to, to these people and multiplied by the number of, uh, of, of the connection. But it's, it's one to one and it's really incredible in terms of uh, uh, efficiency. Yes, I absolutely love your videos. And, uh, and you know, because you, you talk, I talk to you, my dear, you know, and only you, no, not everybody. And this is what you feel and this is what I do because it's very important, you know. It's not, it's not a, yeah, it's not. Uh, yeah, it's it's re it's not broadcasting. It's really narrow casting. Only one person to one. Yeah. Uh, Bruno, I've seen your story. Was it yesterday with the pigeon? But didn't you uh, you invented the t technique to prepare pigeons with a uh, uh, scissors at the speed of light? Tell me about this. What do you want to know? My recipe. <laughs> <laughs> Tell First, me about uh, <laughs> First of all, this is incredible pigeon, and there, and you know, there is something fun because this pigeon comes from La Guerche de Bretagne, and La Guerche de Bretagne, this is the tiny village where Alain Passat was born, and there is no reason for that. But there is a guy named Joël Poirier uh, who makes this pi this pigeon uh, growing, and this is the most incredible pigeon I ever had. You know, it's incredible quality incredible softness taste they are tasty but not too strong just incredible so we have to we we, we try to treat them well and um so first of all uh, we cook them in a in a stove you know this big cocotte um and inside we put some hay and uh, i have also um but i don't know the english the english name for that uh, which is tiel uh, you know it's a uh, it's a flowers on a tree that you do some infusion with. It tastes a little like honey and a little like a orange blossom on the same time. It's tea, maybe maybe teal or something. I don't know. Okay, we have to check. I don't know. But by the way, it's not so important. And so we, we just cook a little bit like, like this, maybe 10 minutes inside the cocotte closed because that makes the fat melt a little bit and the fat get back the aroma of the A and the teal. And then uh, we just roast it a little bit and um, then we tie them like a shibari, uh, you know, session, the pigeon, and we put a lake on it like the Chinese style. To tell you the truth, um, I was doing that with, uh, with game. Uh, we had some uh, duck, canard col vert during the game period. And uh, I decided to do like in a Chinese way with the lake of uh, uh, mole, which is, uh, you know, chili, chocolate, but I also uh, uh, some flavor. Yeah. And hibiscus too and some, uh, and some chicken juice. Um, a nice reduction. So it's going very thick with the heat. And then it's, a, it's make a glaze, a beautiful glaze, like a very expensive shoes looking, you know very glazy and uh, i was doing that for the duck um and uh, one day we had a very important italian chef at the restaurant and the the people that the, the serve him they promised that oh the chef gonna cook a duck incredible glazed duck for you and then when they came back but they don't tell told me and when they came back to me there was no duck anymore because i don't know we have 12 and we don't have any left and i say okay let's do a pigeon like a duck and by the way 
it's much more better than a duck because the, the game <laughs> dogs are a bit dry and not too fatty and blah, blah. But the pigeon, they are so crazy. So this way, so I keep the recipe. I say, okay, now I don't do duck this way. I will do only the pigeon like a duck, like a glazed duck, you know, that this is the recipe. <laughs> I personally love games so much. I mean, my favorite is squab, uh, yeah. partridge. And I always question myself, how come, uh, I mean, I grew up in Europe, but how come U.S. does not have appreciation for it? I, I see it sometimes on the menu in the restaurants, but people here don't, um, they don't seem to love it. Why do you think this is? I don't know because I, I, I think it's, a, it's difficult. Most of the time, you know, the chef point of view with that is doing things very, uh, uh, you know, very intense in terms of taste, very intense in terms of, of juice, very intense in terms of uh, cooking and preparation. And ma by the way, and even maturation. As far as I'm concerned, I'm not very familiar with that. I prefer to treat it in a very uh, quiet way not too intense, very soft, very nice. And, uh, and uh, I, I, you know, I, I can understand that because when I, if I go to a restaurant, sometimes I'm, I, I'm not very close to the way they prepare uh, gaming. And I do prefer not choosing that than uh, being to something too strong for me or too intense. I like, I, I, I like softness, you know. I'm a soft boy. You're a soft boy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Bruno, what do you think is the greatest challenge to run a restaurant? What is what do you find the most to be for, for sure to be consistent. consistent? Yeah, this is the biggest challenge, being consistent on each plate, you know. And uh, when you do a lot as this this time, this period of time, because we really do a lot, we, we do maybe uh, yeah, sixty-five to seventy guests a day. Uh, they have to be guests, not customers. It's a very important point. So we have to re we have re to really take care to give them a lot of love, a lot of attention, a lot of and understanding what what they are what they, what are their expectations, what who they are, how they think, what do they like, and uh, and being you know a little in advance in uh, in the, in their request to be very close of them. So it's a lot of attention. So it's a, so you you you're very tired by at, by the end of the day because it takes so much from you and on the same time make managing your staff to be consistent i mean on the kitchen side and on the service side and on the wine side so it's difficult very very difficult to, uh, and more you're exhausted more it's difficult and but there is no way there is no reason everybody have to be at the t at the top of the top is that is like running you know on a on the edge of a of a mountain you you cannot stop and you cannot sorry it's mental work as well it's not just physical because it's yeah 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 it's it's like running you know on on the crest and you you but you cannot stop because if you stop you, you fall down and you cannot fall down but you have to run at the top at the top at the top at the top and you cannot rest it's very difficult being consistent I with a lot of, sh of love sharing, with a lot of attention, and with the perfect cooking of everything, perfect, perfect looking of the plates, everything, everything is difficult. You know, I, when I used to live in Japan, I feel uh, like most of the chefs, if, if not all, have the same philosophy as you. Um, I think it's a very, it's approach that comes from Japan, China, where, a customer is not a customer, but it's a guest. For sure, for sure. I mean, there is many restaurants where you, you don't care. You, you, you just want to be a customer. You don't care. You, you know what I mean? But when you come to a restaurant like mine in Tab, no way. You're here for to sharing an incredible experience that makes the, the place. You cannot get any this kind of experience in any other places you know it's very special very specific and if you want to have it you have to come to tab and if you come to tab you want to have it so we have you 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 you, you know we have to deliver no way not delivering it um you know when i spent a few months staging with um, chef zayo hasegawa at den 
I, it was incredible to see that every customer, they knew every single customer, they had a track, which dates they were there, what they had eaten last, their birthdays. If the customer came months later, we would give a birthday card. Every, every time we would walk out the guests out of the restaurant, we would bow and say thank you, wave, and it was just a beautiful experience. I think it's really, really important. That yeah. You are, you have a very period and... Uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 for, for sure, it's very important. No, and to notice if the people, they, la they like to have a glass of water when they, when they just come in and if it's sparkling or not or whatever. It's very important, very important. But at the same time, the process cannot be the solution. We need process, but we need also to be, you know, very receptive to the customers, the mood, the way they move, the way, the way they want the things to be done, if they want to know a lot or if you have to be very quiet with them. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, mood change for people or, or because they are not with the same guests at the table, they, the, 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 the behavior is a bit different. So you really have to be really, really, really like a sponge, you know, to, to, to understand the immediately the information and to give it back. Yeah. So process is not the only solution. I know that you people love process. We 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 are kids for process, but <laughs> we we have some uh, you know we we try to to be more close to to make the things too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding you. I'm kidding you. <laughs> Having had a pleasure to eat at your restaurant, um, I can testify you make the best uh, petit verre. Uh, <laughs> I do remember that. <laughs> uh, first of all, what is the key to a great petit beer? And second, did it take you many, what was the process of creating it and um, perfecting it? Did it take you uh, years and, and trials and errors or to, to perfect it to such a way? Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a, it's a, I hope that you have maybe 10 more hours for interviewing me because it's a very complex question and PTVA is a very complex matter. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not the king of the PTVA. I, I try to do it my best, but you know, this is the absolute chef of the haute cuisine française. Uh, PTVA comes from something very interesting because it's, it's come maybe from uh, people like Vatel, uh, we, who were mostly a pastry chef and they move to the salty part. And at the same time, they have some uh, architecture pretension. They, that was the, the period of this time that we, that they prepare food as a building, uh, you know, like a Versailles. And, uh, and at the same time, uh, they have the same uh, preoccupation as the pastry chef in terms of a very pinpointed every element, every grams or everything, time of cooking and blah, 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 blah. That means that they do really absolutely chef d'oeuvre. Um, and there is some uh, huge chef in Paris uh, that they are doing that very, very well. And as far as I'm concerned, I, I cannot do that because, I, you know, I'm mostly an autodidact, so I can bring my brain to the story but I, I'm not a moth, a meilleur ouvrier de France who spent 20 years learning how to, to buy the PTV or whatever. So uh, what I was interested in the PTV, except of the old story and bringing back to, let's say, to reality, to, the, to our period of time, is that for me, it's an interesting matter because you cook the things inside something, which is the all the, 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 the pâte feuilletée, or the, the other part I do, but that means it, it's cooked inside, like, a, uh, you know, like if it's steam. And I do remember that I, I used to read in books that the, in, the, in the politic times, they used to do something which is for sure not PTV, but they cook it the same way because they, they make a big hole, uh, you know, in the glaze and they put some stones and a lot of woods and then they make a very big fire, and then they put some fresh leaves, and they put the things that they have to cook more, in the more intense way, close to the stones, and then they, 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 they do like a chateau of things, you know, and they usually finish with a, 
uh, with fish, with crab, with shells, with small things that uh, they have to bring the salt or bring some taste to the things and then they close it and they let, they let it over the night. And when I was thinking about my TV, I said, we, we have to work the same way as the Paolitic things because it could be interesting. And so I do my, uh, my, my own building, you know, by putting the, the foie gras on the top because this foie gras will bring the fat to everything. And then I put some uh, veggies things could be a cab most of the time cabbage or you know or some leaves that we have here and then i do with a i don't know it could be poultry pheasant or pigeon or goose or or you know any kind of a of meat that we prepare it we cook a little bit and then we do some uh, mushroom eggplant um the the the, the legs the legs of the of the volatile and uh, and then we close that all and that's been during the time of cooking because the heat comes from the upper part of the oven that that's make the thing going like that very slowly and bringing the every taste every fat every taste to the mushroom part and egg blend part we, we keep it you know and so that was the way i uh, i do my ptva uh, and I use uh, not the pâte feuilletée uh, because for me it's a bit too fatty. And uh, but I use a pâte from the old time that we 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 call petit pâté de pezonas, which is done about uh, half of butter, half of fat of a chicken or duck, half of a of wheat, we use uh, old species of wheat, and a half of of pomme de terre, of potatoes, and and so it's very interesting because it's it's remained very crushy, but inside it takes also the aroma of everything. Sounds like poetry to me. <laughs> no, it's yeah, and uh, you know that was really. Uh, that was, to, 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 I mean, my, my brain part was really in the story to try to get to figure out what is the story of a PTVA, except that you have to do a shader in terms of looking. And after that, it takes me, after I get the point, you know, so it was easy to do, but I will, uh, I spend a lot of times, I'm sorry, I, you hear, I'm sorry, there was a phone call. Um, and that, it takes me a lot of time, maybe, I don't know, maybe six months practicing to make it beautiful because it has to be beautiful. So you have to practice a lot, practice and practice to find the solution to make everything very stable, very beautiful and uh, doing your little carving things on it. And then you use the saffron saffron, and, and, uh, and uh, egg yolk to, to make the the beautiful gold color after it's cooked and then we put the juice and some honey on it to make it more shiny and more beautiful once again and uh, and after that it's done you just put a, some white salad a lot of a little of acidity and you have the perfect dish rich uh, not too, not fatty but rich intense of uh, elegant aroma and on the same time very fresh by the way because a lot of veggies parts inside what a thing to master. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> one day a little bit. <laughs> um, um, I also, um, I can, I know that your philosophy is um, you don't really order specific products from the producer, but you, you let the producer to ensure the best product at the best yeah. time and the quality available. Yeah, this is correct. Yeah. I think this is the best way, you know, because when, when, when you, you want to take care of the planet and taking care of the people of the ecosystem and, uh, and uh, you know, and uh, all the, yeah, e e economy, bio economy of everything, you cannot push people to say, these people to say, okay, I need, I don't know, 20 kilo of tomatoes, 10 kilo of uh, beans, blah, 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 blah. No, you, you cannot do that because this will make them change a little bit the way that they process. And so that will affect, for sure, uh, the ecosystem and the sustainability of their business. So I, uh, I always work this way with everybody, which is very simple for me to say, you send me what you have in the quantity you have available on the time you, you just be do believe it's perfect. And then 
that means that daily we get some deliveries and with that i create daily new dishes or new menu or whatever and uh, i have my palette i have my universe but after that we we could and it's very important also for the staff because that's made the people going out of the routine they have to disrupt uh what they know and they and and they, they have to you know they, they have to move out of the comfort zone because you cannot replicate duplicate always the same things because every day you have the turbo you have the crayfish you have uh, the, the the chicken and everything no you have to to try to figure out what you get making your brain uh, very aware of what you get and thinking about that talking all together to say okay we're going to do that we're going to do that how we don't blah 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 and then that's make the people more creative and more uh, you know intense of the way they cook and uh, they take care of the of the guest absolutely it's everything i stand against is a mass production it's uh, yeah i i, I yeah that, that was it's a consequence of my choices but it's a very efficient consequence because that makes the people to be very very creative and really doing the things a la minute and thinking why they are doing the things this way and not just duplicate or replicate. <laughs> uh, you know, we have in common, I, I know that you love to watch people eat. And I noticed that I had this fascination with watching people eat since I was really, really young. And um, I, I, it, it always gave me so much pleasure. And I think, uh, it, it, I just think it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> Yeah, because, uh, yeah, you know, uh, yes, I'm like you, I, I like to watch. <laughs> no, no, uh, you know, it's very important watching people eating, for sure, because it makes me happy. That's the reason why I cook. I love feeding people, for sure. But on the same time, this gives you so much information of the way you can cook for people. When you, when you do a macassé menu, it's very important to see. You just... You, 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 you do a try, you know, you send a plate to somebody um, because you do believe that it could be, could be okay. And you just look how the way they, they, they get it, if, if they feel like wow, or they, they are a little like this or blah, blah, blah. And then you, you can decide what you do. Even if you do, you know, the same dishes for all the table, they are not the same dishes because they are really dedicated to each people. So in my restaurant that you know, we can see everybody's eating because there is no frontier between the kitchen part and the, uh, and the room part. And so uh, this teach me a lot. And for example, I, uh, last year, uh, I had to cook in Milano at Identita e Golosi, and the kitchen was not uh, close to the room. And I was like, if I was blind, you know, that was very, very weird experience for me because no way to get any feedback from people except talking to the waiters who say, Baba, but it's, it's don't bring you anything. You know, it doesn't bring you anything, even if it's not reliable, but don't bring you back something. And so it's, it was very interesting. Uh, Bruno, how has COVID impacted your restaurant? How, is, how are things going for table right now? As you know, we've been closed, to, let's say what, two, uh, two months and a half. But uh, I was very proactive on the media. I was very proactive in my restaurant because I used to cook for the, for the people taking care in the hospital. I do it for free. I buy good, good ingredients, the same as the one I, I use for table because I, I, was, I had the feeling that I have to support my, all my, my supplier because if not, they, they're going to they, they're gonna disappear because nobody buy them anymore. And so most of these people, they have two solutions to sell their production is the market, they were closed and restaurant, they were closed. So I say, okay, what I'm gonna do? I just close my eyes and I say, okay, maybe there is some, they, they will be still there when we reopen or I do something. So I decided to buy them uh, some ingredients to cook for hospital first. And then uh, I, I was thinking, okay, I should do a emporté, you know, uh, uh, so a tab to go, let's say. Uh, but on the same time, I wanted the people, they commit themselves cooking. So I just create recipes that they can do very easily home. Some it's already done, some they have to do, they have to cook, but in a very simple way and very easy way that, and uh, with 100% of success, uh, you know, at the, uh, at the key. And, uh, and so that was interesting. And I sell a lot. 
I buy a lot from my uh, suppliers. And so that's bring me some money to the restaurant to pay the rents and uh, some bills. And uh, by the way, you know, we were, we, that, that I had some of my people because they would be, uh, you know, all, all spreading out France. And uh, uh, so they, some of them come back some of them doesn't want to come back, but after some time they come back because they they know that we were running things at Tal. So that brings the everybody back to the family, the Tab family working together. And so when we had to reopen on June second, everybody was ready. Uh, all my uh, uh, little farmers, fishermen, uh, and everybody was so happy uh, that I, I helped them a lot. So they they sent me an incredible. Uh, incredible things and so we start very strongly uh we don't have any uh, problems in uh, terms of uh, of quality or or whatever with tab because we were in i say the, maybe not the first day but on the second day we were almost at the top when we was when we closed the restaurant so that was very let's say that was clever and effective and a very efficient for tab and to tell you the truth, June was one of, that was in terms of incomes, the best ever uh, months of the of the table uh, since seven years. Wow, this is yeah. really wonderful. That was crazy, and I, I do I do believe that July is going to be about the same. Uh, the the main problem we have now is that we cannot figure out what's what's going to be after holidays september october november december because they, for sure there will be no tourists there will be nobody like that so will will the french people still uh, back to restaurants and being very very sharing a lot with us i don't know well um i can uh, for sure say that once i am back allowed in france i'll be the first to come <laughs> thank you Food. Uh, yeah. and, and you know, to wrap, Chef, uh, it was so, so lovely to see you and catch up. And it was, uh, thank you for your time and uh, to be breaking bread with me. And I so hope we can share a glass of uh, Calvados very soon. <laughs> <laughs> and I will do the special PTV for you, for sure. And so, and so many new things. You will be so happy. Thank you so much for holding me in your show. Thank you so much. Huh? Thank you. And you, and you all take care. Huh?